Dr. Arash Javanbach, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, we've been having a nice chat uh, before uh, turning on the the recorder here, and uh, and so I'm looking forward to speaking with you and getting to know you better. We're going to be talking about your book, your new book on fear, and and uh, I have a lot of praise for the book, and I'm sure it'll come come out in the interview. Um, how did you come to write this particular book at this particular time? So I'm a psychiatrist and do neuroscience research in academia. I also treat people, treat patients, and my focus is in trauma and anxiety, and both in research and clinical work. I work with uh, survivors of torture, human trafficking, first responders, oh. I do research with these populations, and of course, any sort of anxiety and fear. And at some point in my life, <clears throat> the same way, same way you found out, I found that it's very important to be engaged in public education because I invest tons of time in getting grants and doing research and publishing the papers. After 10 years, the paper is published, 20 people will read it. But then there's a huge dissociation between what is in research and what is in the public sphere. And there's a lot of misinformation out there also. So I got involved in writing for the media outlets. Actually, the first piece I wrote was about 10 years ago about the science of fright and what we want to be afraid. I wrote it for uh, the conversation for Associated Press uh, around the Halloween time. And that piece was read by near a million people. Wow. And then I realized how strong it is to this, this tool of talking to the public. And then of course, throughout the time, I wrote more and more anything about politics of fear, uh, trauma, stress, different treatments, basically all these different areas of fear and anxiety. Part was to educate the public, part was my own curiosity. At some point I'm like, okay, what's the intersection between anxiety and creativity? How do they interact with each other? Let me learn and explore and then also talk to the public about what I learned and what I found. And then, <clears throat> Of course, also in the clinic, I talk to my patients and I educate them all the time because I'm not just a pill guy. I talk about different ways yeah. of reducing anxiety from social life to exercise to all these different aspects of how we can help the brain and uh, the body. And at some point, I thought that, well, I have done all of these different aspects. I've written on all these different aspects in a concise manner. How about I put them all in a book? And it was about a couple of years ago, I started contemplating with the idea. I looked at the different uh, aspects of it, created the outline. And that's how I started working on the book. <clears throat> uh, and interestingly, this book was uh, done, uh, finished in a place I really love. I love the desert. So to wrap up the book, I found this resort next to the mountains in uh, uh, Tucson, Arizona, it's an old resort where uh, John Wayne used to go when he was filming in Tucson. So sat next to the mountain for a couple of weeks and wrapped up the book. And uh, this is the result. This is the book. Yeah, yeah, that's great. It's not very thick. How many pages is it? It's a total of, like, putting aside the citations and bibliography, it's 160 pages in 15 chapters. Am amazing, because there's so much information in that book. I really have to congratulate you on that. And, and I shared with you that uh, I've done a lot of interviews, uh, <laughs> and I've interviewed a lot of people on this topic, more or less. I've interviewed other authors about anxiety and you know and and PTSD and all of that but I learned a lot reading your book I expected to uh, you know I expected I might be somewhat bored but I was not bored <laughs> so hats off to you for that and uh, and, and one of the interesting facts too is I find that you're uh, were you born in Iran I know your family is from Iran were you were you born there? Born and raised in Iran. I came here about 15 years ago. Wow. And so uh, and so it's no surprise that you like to go to the desert, I'm thinking. It's like there must be somewhat reminiscent of Iran, maybe. Yeah, where I come from in Iran is in the northeast, Mashhad. It's a mountainous, uh, dry land. It's not hot. It's, uh, it's even can get as cold as Michigan sometimes, sometimes. 
But yeah, mountains and dry lands. Uh, yeah, yeah, very good call. That's like just my genes pull me there. And then, and the other part of my ancestry comes, half of my ancestry comes from the desert part of Iran. So maybe uh -huh. that's the genes that pulls me towards the desert. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what makes this book unique compared to other books on fear and anxiety? I think, so when I started working on this book, I looked in the, I, of course, one of the first things, like any other research, you look at what is available in the literature. So I looked at the books that were available to the public. I saw I saw deficiencies there. Number one was that majority of the books are written by people who are not even experts in the field, meaning that these are not people who have even any basic training in the areas of psychology, neuroscience, psychology. Wow. Yeah. And then the other was focus on one subject area. Let's say, okay, the yeah, panic, how to deal with panic. But I didn't find a comprehensive review of fear because that was my goal. I even thought about like naming it Book of Fear, like the Book of uh, Mormon or any book that is just about <laughs> everything fear. Yeah. So, but so because this book covers evolution, I start with what is the evolutionary purpose of fear? What is the fear in the brain? What is fear in the body? How we learn fear? How we unlearn fear? How we, uh, why we enjoy fear? What is the diseases of fear? How we treat them? What are the most novel treatments? What, what's, what are the presentations of fear in the modern life, right? Because this is a, we can talk later about it. This is a, this is an archaic system which is so confused in the modern life. And what is the different aspects and intersections of fear with bravery, with creativity, meaning, politics, media, social media. And I did not find any book that has all these different aspects. Most of them are basically focused on one chapter of this book and, of course, the expansion of it. The other part that I think distinguishes this book from many of the other books is that I don't have the pop psychology approach of kind of sensationality and giving people some uh, some some like an emotional hype or high at the moment and which goes away. I've tried to stand on the solid shoulders of science, but I have also tried not to be boring science because I'm also right. a So I bring examples from clinic, from life. And my wife is uh, my wife is very straightforward, and she has told she told me several times during writing that, are you sure this part is interesting to you or to your audience? So I cut out a, I basically cut out about a third of the book when I was finalizing. I was like, well, this is some sciency <clears throat> uh, procedures or experiments that people might not be interested in the details. What of it is interesting to? a lay educated person, lay in the terms of lay, uh, lay psychologist, neuroscientist, psychiatrist. Uh, but it also is useful for professionals. And then uh, I also finally uh, try to be concise, as you mentioned. So with yeah. all the others covered in the book, it's very concise. I don't beat around the bushes. I don't go to like, I don't know, historical details about my own life and this and that. I just try to deliver to the people what is the substance out of respect for the time of the reader. Yeah. Well, you pack so much into the book, and that's one of the things I really appreciated was that is that it is up to date scientifically from what I can tell. And as a result, I learned stuff, even though I've read a lot in this area and, and interviewed a lot of people in this general area. Uh, but I, I learned things. And, uh, and so there's so much in the book that we obviously can't cover it all in, in this interview. So I'm just going to, we will dive into some of the things that were of particular interest to me uh, that stood out for me as I was going through it. And, um, but I'll, in some ways I'll kind of follow uh, your, the outline of the book. Uh, so one of the things you start off talking about are the, the brain structures that are related to fear and anxiety. So let's move through those quickly. Okay. So uh, just a quick intro about the purpose of the system, right? The fear system is there, and it's very, very old. Like my colleagues in the laboratory are looking at the brains of rats and mice to understand about how fear works in our brain. It's that primitive. 
And this primitive system's job is to look at what is a threat to me and mine. What is the danger to my own existence or integrity and my family and my crops and my animals? Yeah. And one of the things that I recently realized um, is how far down it goes in, in, in species, like little bugs that I want to squash. They pick up on the fact that I'm after them and boom, they, they, they flee. They're out of there. So Absolutely. I don't know if I, I I don't know what their emotional experience is, but it must be something kind of like fear, like fear. They're programmed to get out of here. Yeah, the, the fear learning basically the most primitive and basic fear learning method is associative learning, right? Pavlovian conditioning that happens in the most primitive animals, and it happens in us. I'm bitten by a dog, and I'm terrified of dogs. But in this system, I want to just emphasize was not designed to interact with the dangers of the current time. We're talking about millions of years old system, with right. jobs mostly dealing with physical threats. Somebody attacking me, a predator attacking me, me attacking somebody or the predator or the animal or the hunt or a rock falling at me. So now we are talking about the amygdala, which is a small almond shape, part in the temporal lobe near the ear. Amygdala's job is what we call emotional salient detection. I see something, amygdala decides, should I attack it? Should I run away from it? Should I eat it? Should I have sex with it? Basic instincts. And when it comes to fear, it has to say, is this dangerous? Is this not dangerous? And it works extremely fast. Even a lot of times before I'm aware of something I saw, the amygdala has decided if it is dangerous or not. Right. And, and, it and it, one of the things I learned is that uh, there is... I thought the amygdala was somewhere kind of central, and uh, but what what I learned in your book is there's there are two amygdalas. There's one on each side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One on each side. And interesting from my research, we are finding a lot more happening in the left amygdala. And uh -huh. is that because our verbal brain is a uh, language brain is on the left, and we learn a lot of things through language? Because in brain imaging studies, I've done some, we see a lot of times. The big thing related, to, uh, both have a response, but the, the bigger response is on the left side. So I make the law, looks at something, says, okay, there's a snake or there is a predator. I should freak out and goes off. I see even if we put any of us in a brain scanner and we show us a picture of a scared or angry face of a human, black and white, no hair, no sex, just scared face. My amygdala will fire up. Even I'm not aware, I'm bored and sleepy in the scanner, this goes off. Then next to amygdala is the hippocampus. Hippocampus is known by a lot of people as the memory place, right? That's where we learn things and store things and store memories. Hippocampus is involved in learning of what should be dangerous and scary. For example, a predator or a snake or spider may be biologically scary to us, genetically scary. A lot of us find it scary when we see a snake. But a gun is not coded in our genetic uh, realm of fear, right? We learn guns are dangerous. So hippocampus is involved in learning of fear and all learning of fear when we have to say, okay, this thing is no more dangerous. And then hippocampus also has a role in processing the context and environment because context tells us a lot about if something is dangerous or not. For example, we see the lion. I'm afraid of the lion. Amygdala says, run away. Then I see there's bars between me and the lion, the physical context, it says zoo on top, up, up, up there, cognitive context. People are having fun around here, social context. And hippocampus tells the amygdala, slow down. Context is safe here. That's how hippocampus works in, uh, in fear processing, it puts it in context. Then there's insula a little bit more frontal, still like in this uh, side, but more to coming towards the front. Insula is involved in perception and awareness of my feelings. When I feel the tightness in my stomach or in my chest, when I feel the fear and anxiety, that's insula telling me that, hey, bringing it to my awareness. And, finally, and there's a, le a left and a right insula? Yes, there's a yeah, left again, and right. Yeah, see, I th again, I thought everything was more, more central. So, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and the other thing I, I, I learned was that um, there are new cells 
you know, we, we're now aware of neurogenesis happening in the brain. And we thought forever, you know, that that the brain, once you had your nerves, that was it. Uh, and uh, But you say that in the in some part of the hypothalamus, and it's hard to believe that there are multiple parts <laughs> in such a small structure that's doing so much, but you say that there are... Uh, cells that are being produced all the time, new cells in the hypothalamus. In the hippocampus also. So it's so so this it's so in the hippoc hippocampus, right? Yeah, yeah. But 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 other areas of the brain as well. Yeah, and that is an amazing find we have. As you said, we used to think that once you pass your uh puberty, there's no brain growth. But the thing is in hippocampus every day there are new cells generated. And the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex, amygdala, all of them can shrink as a result of disease and then grow back. Part of the growing back is the new cells. Part of the growing back is the new connections in that there are the new synapses between the cells. So it's a very dynamic and alive system that is working. Yeah. Therapy or treatment helps growth or exercise helps growth in these different areas. So the last part, though, then is the frontal lobe. The front of it, which we see as the cortical brain, the human brain, the advanced brain, civilized brain, all these names that we put on it. So it's usually traditionally in science is seen as the place of emotion regulation, meaning reducing the fear response. For example, I see a spider and then I am aware that spider is on TV. It's not in my room. Or some, or a lot of instructions and information, communications. For example, somebody tells me that I see a boa and I'm terrified. Then my friend comes and says, hey, this boa is safe. This is my pet boa and my fear goes away. So prefrontal cortex is more advanced in, more involved in higher advanced pathways to reducing fear. But something which is a lot of times missed from the conversations is the role of the prefrontal cortex in inducing fear. I come to someone's house, they have a dog. And the dog is smiling and wagging its tail. I'm about to go pet the dog. And the person owner says, hey, watch out. This dog has attacked people. All of a sudden, I experience fear. That's the prefrontal cortex. And that is the part of the brain which is involved in the fears we have learned through words of others. A lot of our prejudices, when the tribe leader tells me that, okay, there's this group of people, you have never met them, they're dangerous, they're here to hurt you, and I'm afraid of them, I'm angry at them, or I want to go hurt them, that's the prefrontal cortex causing the fear and aggression in me. Yeah, I love the complexity that, uh, that you bring into it, indicating that there are different sources of, of fear. And it's not just a simple, a simple thing that it can be, as you say, what you've told, what you've been told, not just what you've experienced, or not just not just your what your genetics are uh, automatically fearful of. Um, now you also talk about uh, the biochemistry of fear and and talk about neurotransmitters. So we don't need to spend a lot of time on that, but. Um, just take us through the basics. Yeah, and that's where our science of medications is so behind. Because we talk about networks in the brain, right? We said these are the, this is the secretary. These are the parts of the brain involved in fear processing, and they dynamically work with each other. But our medications work on neurotransmitters, which are chemicals in the brain, and they're everywhere in the brain. That's that's why we are so behind in medicational the treatment of uh, with medications and psychopharmacology, because my medications don't go straight to amygdala or hippocampus; they go all over the brain. But the major neurotransmitters we're talking about here are norepinephrine and serotonin. Serotonin, we still are not very sure how it works, but it is depending on the where and how much high or low it can induce fear and anxiety. And norepinephrine is mainly involved in the, we talk about adrenaline rush, right? It's involved in anything that comes with the excitement of the system, whether it's real excitement and thrill or fear and anxiety. And that is how the fear also goes from the brain to the body, the sympathetic nervous system. I feel it in my chest. I feel it in my body. I feel it in my stomach. 
because the sympathetic nervous system has its roots everywhere in the body. And its role is basically bringing us to the fight and flight mode. It brings me to be prepared to go fight someone or run away from them. So heart should be pounding, chest is tight, blood pressure is high, tunnel vision, pupils are uh, dilated. All the feelings we have in our body comes from that system. Of course, there are like some GABA is involved in reducing fear, glutamate is involved in increasing fear. And that's because these neural pathways we talked about use a lot of neurotransmitters. So it's very hard to simplify it. And actually, honestly, we don't know enough and much yet how these different uh, neurotransmitters work within these networks. One of the uh, one of the foci of your book is that you look into the the what might seem paradoxical fact that we are drawn to fear at the same time that we are you know that is mostly associated with being something aversive, but there are different ways that we are drawn to it. And you do share some personal details in the book, which I particularly appreciate. And you talk about going down into the, the Grand Canyon on the on the back of a donkey. Uh -huh. and, I, I, and I appreciated even the way you described that the donkeys are actually, it's not a problem for them. They have, they, they know, how, they, they somehow know how to keep their feet uh, where they belong. And, uh, and so they're not, they're not like us looking down and going, ah! Oh! <laughs> and then you talked also about doing being in a jet plane uh, where the pilot, I assume you weren't the pilot, but that you were the passenger and um, doing barrel rolls and things like that. Also in the Grand Canyon? Or is that separate? I, I did some flying, though. I did a couple of rolls, uh, but I was with a pilot. It was in Los Angeles, actually. Okay, so 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 certainly you have saw and this and you can justify this as part of your research, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that you can write about it and talk about it and 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 have these wonderful examples in the book, and um, uh, so let's just talk about that uh, a little bit. The courting of of I don't think we court anxiety, at least not. There probably are people who pathologically court anxiety, <laughs> nurture it, but uh, but we do court fear sometimes. We can talk about this for five hours. So actually, the, <laughs> this guy in the book is myself because I started my life with fear of heights. I was afraid of heights. And then that basically Grand Canyon experience uh became my first big encounter with without i didn't even plan this for a therapy i just planned going to the mule ride to grand canyon it was poor planning i didn't think that i'm afraid of heights and i didn't register there's heights there so when i am there on this animal i see like a few thousand feet below me and i'm terrified and yeah. a few hours basically worked at exposure therapy and helped me to basically overcome this fear before that i couldn't even go up uh, to the attic uh, on a ladder uh, but the, the the excitement we have about fear and anxiety uh, actually you're right more so fear anxiety is more pathological when it becomes a source of excitement for the brain for like for example people who find difficult relationships more lively than other relationships which are considered boring to them right because the brain is used to getting that level of high it's like a cocaine for the brain but coming back to normal life uh our interest in fear has multiple facets i mean one of the stories i've mentioned in the book is when i was with my dad watching at uh, basically a documentary about lions and these lion cubs are uh, wrestling with each other and with their mom and he asked me what are they doing over the world? They're playing. And his answer was, no, they're not just playing. They are preparing for the future fights. So one of the reasons we have this basically, uh, and of course, part is also like any significant emotion, any very important emotion becomes part of the culture, right? We have a lot of movies about love. We have a lot, a lot of movies about aggression. We have a lot of movies about fear and anxiety. But the other part is also, kind of a practice. 
So we need to practice things to be prepared. The system needs to be prepared for bad things to happen. So when I'm watching a horror movie, I don't know about you, but I am constantly thinking about how I could get out of that dangerous situation. Sometimes I even find myself yelling at the actors uh, why they're not doing <laughs> yeah. that. Why are they going this other way? So it's basically you learn vicariously through other people how to deal with these situations if they happen to you in the future. I mean, probably the older version of this was the tribe leaders uh, sitting around the fire with us and telling us about their heroic actions of war and fight. And then the stories of demons and monsters came in. And of course, this is an emotion which is engaging. Any engaging emotion brings us to the table, brings us to listening, brings us to watching the same way now the uh, media and uh, cable news and social media are doing it to us in a detrimental way. But there's also a mindful aspect of fear, mindfulness, meaning that when I am, and we know how much, we, we know a lot about how mindfulness is good for basically reducing uh, anxiety, reducing yeah. fear. When you're watching a horror movie, when you're in a, a thrilling uh, experience, when you're on a roller coaster, you're not thinking about your daytime worries. You're not thinking about anything that is worrying you in your life if you're really scared. Because it's a very consuming emotion and takes you away from your other daily challenges and also gives you a sense of control here. I am in charge, while in my daily anxieties, a lot of times I don't feel in charge. And finally, this is a theory I have been contemplating with for a while. And I don't have a lot of science evidence for it. So we go to the gym. Why do we go to the gym? We go to the, we work out, we do exercise, we go to the gym because this body was developed not for sitting at this desk all day. It was, it evolved to be physically very active. And yeah. when it is not active, it feels sad. It feels unhappy. It feels uncomfortable. It starts falling apart. So we need to simulate its normal life so it can be happier. The same way we go and walk our dogs and uh, uh, run them. So now this fear system, which was evolved in a situation that on a day-to-day -day or regular basis, I would have exposure to dangerous things, danger, really dangerous situations. Now it's not getting those. And that leads to a lot of false alarms and confusions. I am terrified. My heart is pounding in anticipation of meeting with my boss as if I'm going to be uh, sacrificed by the tribe leader. Like the fear we experience in a lot of these situations... Right. The modern life is unusual. So I think my theory here is that doing these kind of activities, thrills, really scary things, gives an exercise to the fear system. A lot of people who are thrill seekers are actually anxious people. It gives an exercise to the fear system and slows it down in other situations and also puts things in perspective. When I am standing on the edge of a cliff in Grand Canyon, I'm staring down at my own death, right? If I fall, I die. So that's real fear. Yeah. And when I come back from that experience, how scary is, I don't know, my paper not getting upset, uh, published or this problem, this other problem I'm worried about my car or about my relationships. So it puts things in perspective. So I think there are so many dimensions in how thrill-seeking and fear-seeking helps us. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like to read. Uh, I don't go to horror movies. I hate horror movies, but I read crime novels. Uh, and I'm kind of addicted to reading crime novels. And and so I I look at that kind of in the context of what you're saying as a, something similar going on. You know, I, uh, I don't want to find myself in, in those situations that the heroes and the crime stories find themselves in but it's a way in imagination i can i can uh vicariously have the experience of some hero heroism mm -hmm. i think that's what, I, what i'm one of the things that i'm you know and and of survival you know in very difficult situations um so yeah, yeah that so gets, how, how would i do it or or i learn some new skills if i'm in that situation now i know more now i'm prepared and a lot of times anxiety that's how anxiety works right anxious people keep practicing different scenarios different outcomes the more anxious you are the more outcomes you're analyzing or like i'm anticipating a meet, difficult meeting like in three days and i think about how all these different 10 ways it could go out and then the the next step and then the next step and that's how 
like we try to prepare ourselves when we are scared or put ourselves in scary situations to prepare ourselves for future. Yeah, yeah. Okay, where are we here? <laughs> I'm thinking of different things all at once here. One of the, one of the things I really appreciated was your... Uh, we both spent a lot of time in Ann Arbor, Michigan, at the University of Michigan. You were you were in medical school. Uh, I uh, years earlier was in uh, uh, studying uh, clinical psychology, mm -hmm. and um, so you have a story in there about the most famous dog of Ann Arbor. And I thought, oh, I got to look at this because I had a story of the famous dog, not stopping to think that. Oh, wait a second. I was there years before you were in Ann Arbor. Probably not the same dog. Uh, uh -huh. but, but, but you gave a, a link to, uh, and it's a good thing you named the dog, because when I tried, uh, as you suggested, Googling the most famous dog in Ann Arbor, that didn't do it. But uh -huh. ja Jasper, the dog's name, and I did that, then that took me to the story that you were directing us to. And it was about... Uh, how you, uh, did somebody give you this dog? How did you come to have this dog? Uh, he was a retiring stud, a great Pyrenees that I adopted because since childhood, I always wanted to have this breed. Ah, okay. Yeah. So this is a huge dog and, huge. and, and it could be scary if a person had a fear of dogs. Mm -hmm. And so, and so you were able to use that as a tool clinically with people that you were working with with their fear of dogs yeah 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 uh, so first of all this guy was so elegant and so composed and calm gentle yeah. stoic that i mean a lot of people fell in love with him as, as you mentioned an article was written about him and uh but uh i a few times i went to uh, actually, University of Michigan uh, to basically brought students and family members of them who were afraid of dogs to overcome their fear of dogs. And Jasper wasn't ideal for that because he's predictable. He was calm. He was composed. He wouldn't be jumpy. He wouldn't jump on people. So he wouldn't surprise them. And that helped a lot. It was amazing to see even at the end, like uh, older people who have been afraid of dogs all their life would come and just hug Jasper and took photos of him and then with the uh, we might talk about the, the new augmented mixed reality technology we are oh using. yeah uh, definitely want to get there yeah so yeah. just come and basically be the test meaning that okay we did this virtual treatment now we want to see how that treatment applies in real world so we would see how close people would get to jasper now that Jasper is gone, uh, Mishka, who's our next great Pyrenees, he's basically taking up his role, and Mishka is going to my clinic the days that we are running research participants. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I want to share with you and the audience my my dog story um, uh, in Ann Arbor, where uh, this was during the 60s when I was in school there, and uh, uh and so one way of confronting fears was to uh, ex experience the psychedelics that were uh, happening at that time, LSD and so on. God knows what it really was, uh, mm -hmm. whether it was really LSD or whatever. But at any rate, I had uh, uh, taken uh, a psychedelic at, at night with uh, with a friend, and was and uh, and we had amazing adventures which i won't go into um and come morning oh and at some point i picked up this dog this dog started following me and i just felt like i had this great rapport with this dog and uh and uh you know i was worried oh am i stealing this dog you know the dog is going with me everywhere and so uh, that he really enhanced my experience and um affectionate and, and you know and uh then as the morning came on i encountered uh somebody came up to me and a guy came up and he said hey man are you tripping you know and i got very paranoid <laughs> wait a second and and he said the reason i ask is because 
you've got this dog that just loves people who are tripping. And, and the dog is known for this. I thought, <laughs> isn't that amazing? <laughs> That's big. Yeah, and it makes sense, you know. Oh, yeah, the dog, dogs like attention from, from human beings. And uh, and somebody who's uh, who's uh, has a psychedelic and the world looks totally magical, and they really get into the dog. <laughs> and, and and dogs are so good at picking up people's emotions. Yeah, they might have felt your because you're in a delighted, cool emotion at that moment, right? Peaceful and happy. So maybe they pick on it. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to share that with you. Let's get so we don't run out of time. Uh, that was one of the things that uh, that really caught my attention because I'm a, a technology freak, and and uh, to see that you were using uh, virtual reality and uh, AR. I'm blocking on what AR stands for. Augmented reality. Aug augmented reality, right? The two are very closely related. So tell us about and, and you've got again. You give us uh, a, you, you give us uh, we you could tell us where we can go on your website to mm -hmm. see uh, presentations about that. So I I did that and I uh, was very impressed. So tell us about how you're using that stuff. Absolutely. So um, we talked about how exposure therapy works. It's a very good treatment for situations where I'm afraid of something which I know is safe. Yeah. I'm afraid of dogs, spiders, flying, uh, I don't know, uh, snakes, humans in social anxiety or PTSD. But I logically know it is safe. It's just somehow my brain has associated that object or that situation with danger, whether through my past experiences or learning from others or just uh, randomly. And... Exposure excellently works in these situations, but as uh, let's say somebody comes to my clinic and says, I'm afraid of dogs, snakes, or spiders. I don't have a dog or a snake or spider in my office. Even let, let's say I go and bring my dog to the clinic. Number one, it's a lot of work. Well, number two, that dog may be unpredictable. A lot of times people don't even are not even willing to start with the real object. So I thought when I learned about augmented reality, this is an amazing opportunity. And the difference between augmented and virtual reality is that virtual reality, you wear the goggles, you go to another world. Augmented reality is like Iron Man. Like it's like uh, the, uh, you're wearing sunglasses. You see your real world, but then you also see virtual objects mixed with your real world. So you can walk around this environment and you can interact with these objects and your real environments and you see your therapist. So we started with basically creating fear of spiders treatment situations, meaning that you wear these goggles, I see a 3D map of your environment, and I choose a spider of any size, color type I want, and I put it in your environment. And I tell the spider what to do, crawl on the wall, go on the ceiling, I put the spider web here, uh, and then did a clinical trial. First of all, we found the brain is so amazingly dumb that people <laughs> get terrified of these objects while they know they are real. The animal brain reacts to them as if they are real. People freak out, which is what we need for treatment because if they are not yeah. afraid, it will not work. And after we finished a clinical trial, which was published, everybody was able to touch a real live tarantula or the tank containing this tarantula after one session, one hour treatment. Wow. And we advanced, advanced to fear of dogs. Now we have a Labrador, a gold, uh, a Doberman, a, a pit bull in front of you, and then you interact with these dogs. And now we are running the same clinical trial, and that's why Jasper would come to clinic and now Mishka to see how this treatment works in real world. They go hug the dog, they go walk the dog, pet the dog, it works. And now we have brought it to the realm of human interactions, which is amazing. We are working with a company. These people have done work with Marvel and Disney and all these big studios. We are creating very realistic humans. And the idea is that a lot of people with PTSD who have been traumatized by humans don't want to be around people. They avoid humans. So now you wear these goggles. All of a sudden, there's a party in this house. Two humans walk through that virtual door in that corner, stop talking to each other. Three people in this corner, four people. And gradually, a lot of people, a lot of noise, some of these characters come to you. 
And we are seeing it really helps. Now we have a police station, a fire station, because we work with first responders. We have a grocery store and then characters that I can pick, put in front of you, and I will tell them what to do. I'll type and they will uh, 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 basically tell you what I want in a real life. Real, I'm sorry, real time. But now, actually, today we saw the first video. We have got to the realm of artificial intelligence. Yeah. So I write an AI brain for this character. And this character will have an automated conversation with you. So you wear the goggles. There's a woman. Her name is Amy. She's the first one. And actually, your show is the first time I'm talking about Amy because Amy was created today. And we wrote her brain. And you put uh, we put Amy in front of you. He will have a conversation with Amy. Automated. And people can practice job interviews, dating, uh any situation of human encounter they're avoiding or they're afraid of. So I see a tremendous possibilities for this, not only in the realm of PTSD and anxiety, but also autism, social anxiety, job skills trainings, a lot of social training, especially post-pandemic. Yeah, I, you know, I've been following uh, developments at Apple Computer and their, their new uh, Apple Vision and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and system and uh but none of this stuff occurred to me you know i they don't they, they don't go down that path mm -hmm. uh but but it has uh but you you you're mining this uh technology for for uh potential uh yeah. for for its, its therapeutic potential which is very creative on your part and uh and you're you have good social skills. You must have good social skills to be able to enlist <laughs> these people in these companies to get them excited and get them working with you. Oh, it uh, has been it has been very exciting process because we also have to, as you said, I have to learn how to work with the technology people and within the limitation of technology, but also be clinically relevant because, like, constantly as we are creating this technology, I keep reminding us we want this to be useful to a psychotherapist, a social worker, psychologist out there in a small clinic who is not very technologically savvy. So how can we make this as easy to use as possible? Because at the end of the day, it is not used in day-to-day -day clinics out there. And it's just an academic tool. I wasted time. I want this to be something that is useful in the community. Well, this is a, a, like biofeedback. I, I, you know, been around as biofeedback moves from being strictly a laboratory with a lot of equipment to uh, practitioners now have you know small biofeedback devices that they can purchase and uh, to do uh, you know uh, training and and um, and so the, and the technology is going to come down to that level uh, where the individual clinical practitioners will be able to afford to uh, bring this stuff on and use it. So you're, you're paving the way. And I, I'm, um, I'm really engaged by your, your curiosity. And one of the things that, um, that I was really impressed by is that you have gone out with first responders to so, so you say, okay, I want to understand people who are traumatized. And so I'm going to put myself in a place where I can see people dealing with traumatic situations and so on. And also, I think you you actually work with uh, uh, traumatized uh, uh, first, what do they call it? First uh, responders. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, so we start. Yeah, no, sorry, go well, no, you go. <laughs> uh, so we started working with first responders a few years ago, cops, firefighters, dispatchers, uh, EMTs. And as you said, before this, I didn't know much about them. I mean, you talk about police, you talk about dispatch, EMTs, well, that's the life they have. But when you go in, you see, especially in the cities, they see the worst of what humans do to each other or to themselves any domestic abuse, any murder, any torture, any uh, 
death, any horrible accident, any uh, fire, police uh, and firefighters are there and dispatchers hear about it on an ongoing regular basis. And a lot of times they are shot at, they have been in situations of danger and I have tons of stories. I've mentioned some of their stories in the book. And they lose their partners in uh, whether it's a fire or a shooting. So they have a life filled with trauma. Like trauma is the norm of their lives. I mean, they see things on a day-to-day basis. When I hear about it, I feel sick. So, and I had to go out with them, do ride along with the fire and with the police to learn about what is their life. Because when I, I didn't understand them much. I mean, I could see their eyes and they're smart people. Their job is to read people and they could read in me that I don't know what's going on with them. But now that I've worked more with them and I I understand them better, uh, it's been a very fulfilling job. It's uh, because they have a lot of trauma and stress and there's a lot that can be done for them. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's remarkable. Um, is, uh, maybe there's something that we haven't touched on here, but that you'd like to people to know before we uh, wrap things up. Uh, I think an important part uh, from the subjects in the book is, I mean, there are a couple aspects. One is how we can... That fear and anxiety, we have started to look at them as basically an infected appendix that we have to pull out and throw away. But in reality, this is a very important, integral, intimate part of me and has a role. There's ways that we can use and utilize anxiety in ourselves to basically in our own advantage. There is a, we can use them as a partner, as a friend, or tame them and use them the same way we do with any other animal. And this is an animal inside us. So there's a whole chapter in the book I've talked about positive use and how basically to deal with anxiety in advancing our own purpose. But the other part that I want to expand a little bit more on is politics of fear and media and fear, uh, because this is has become a plague of our time. A lot of people watch cable news and anytime, regardless of what cable news, whether it's Fox or CNN or MSNBC, after two hours of watching it, you feel like the whole world is going down in flames. It has yeah. become, look, you should be afraid. You should be afraid. You should be scared. You should be scared. And same is with social media. A lot of times there's tons of fear. And I want to explain very briefly in the remaining time we have why this is happening. The reason it is happening is that the system, the, 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 the market has become extremely competitive in the realm of media and social media. And these guys are all fighting for viewership. So when you open Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, the top priority for that company is revenue. And revenue comes from maximum engagement. So Facebook or Instagram's algorithm's job is to engage you as long as possible, scrolling and clicking. And what I've been learned is that emotions suck us in. Emotions attract us. Anything emotion related attracts us because the animal just jumps in. And the negative emotion is more so because fear becomes a fear is, is something that becomes priority. If you're feeling danger, you cannot think about anything else. You cannot think about beautiful flowers out there. You just think about what is dangerous. You're thinking about the gunman that could be on the loose in your neighborhood. So our, all of these, whether it's algorithms or Fox or MSNBC, they have learned that fear glues us to the TV or the phone. And that's why there's become so much focus on it. And then the animal in me gets involved and engaged. I'm not at a conscious level because if you're watching cable news for five hours, you're not learning more than if you watch that same cable news for one hour because they keep repeating the same thing. Or like, so you have probably, most viewers have seen, people pick up their phone, scroll, scroll Facebook, now scroll uh, Instagram, now scroll this other app, Put it down, immediately they pick it up and go back. It's as if like the animal is doing it. It's unconscious. Yeah. And that a lot of it is like because of these both negative and positive addictions, whether it's positive emotions or mostly negative emotions. So I would want to encourage people to have a more conscious approach to how their fears and negative emotions are being utilized for someone else to make money. 
and you don't that's the worst thing you want to happen for if someone else is making money out of your happiness go ahead and do it but someone else is making money out of your misery i don't think it's a good deal good point good point we probably don't have enough time to go into uh you know i'm tempted to to tie into video games and the time that kids spend uh, uh doing video games but uh i i think this can be extrapolated to that and and part of it is probably it can be seen as that they're working at that interface of uh, emotional interface and and trying to develop some competence in that environment. Competence is a strong uh, motivational thing as well, I think. Absolutely. And a sense of control. It's aligned yeah. with competence. I cannot exert my much control in the outside world, especially in the time of COVID that I haven't developed a lot of social skills as a kid. Now I'm a boss in this game. Now I can go dominate things and kill things and do all the things that a powerful person can do. Yeah, yeah. Compensation for lack of control out there. And of course, dopamine system, we all know it's how addicting and a rat would keep hitting the lever for dopamine until it dies. Same right. we do it's a casino or a video game on Facebook. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess that's that's the note we're going we're gonna to close with here. I have to say I'm uh, really excited about your work and what you do and just uh, keep on doing what you do and, and, and learning and expanding and teaching and, and therapizing because I think, uh, I think you're great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I really enjoyed the conversation and your curiosity and your welcoming mind.